Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the broadcast. It's Friday, April 13th, 2018. I'm Sean, your host. Website is www.scriptureandprophecy.com. And uh, I'm getting to the point where I'm going to be utilizing that a lot more and moving away from the corrupt uh, social media platforms. So we'll be talking about more about that uh, as we move uh, forward into the future. Uh, but the website, www.scriptureandprophecy.com, is where you can go to uh, see the archives. Um, it's where I post devotionals and occasionally write some things. I'm also going to start posting videos there that I find compelling or interesting uh, from other people. And uh, that's where you also go to support this mission. Uh, so if this podcast is blessing you, um, if this mission of truth is blessing you and you want to bless me back... Uh, you can do that by going to scriptureandprophecy.com and you can donate or become a uh, Patreon subscriber, uh, which also gives you early access to the Hebrew, biblical, and modern Hebrew training courses that uh, will be coming out. All right, uh, today we are looking at Matthew chapter 21. And in this chapter is where Jesus tells this parable and he plainly tells the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, that the kingdom is being taken from them and given to someone else, given to another, uh, someone else who would receive him, which we know to be the Gentiles, uh, which is how we have uh, the church today. And, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, right now, because of all the false doctrines going around about Israel and about the Jewish people and They've completely rejected actual, you know, Christianity for that's been the foundations of our faith for a thousand, a couple thousand years. Uh, rejecting the church fathers, rejecting the great commentary commentators, rejecting the great preachers of our faith uh, for these false doctrines. Even though the scriptures plainly say these things, you know, people will be upset that I've that is, the people will be upset already that I said that the kingdom has been taken from them and given to another, even though that's what Jesus plainly describes and plainly spells out for them. And the scriptures go on to say that that's also what the Pharisees understood it to mean. And then they, they sought to kill him. You know, I'm reminded by the Gospel of John, the very first chapter. Uh, what does it say? Verse 11, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them, being them being those who have received him, gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood. You catch that? Blood is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Your bloodline it has no value. It's all about faith. Which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And in many places it talks about how, look, there is no longer this whole thing of Jew and, and Gentile. That's no longer a thing. It's all about Christ, and that's how you become the seed of Abraham. This is not in my opinion. This is what the scriptures say. I'll give you three examples shortly, quickly here, and then we'll get into Matthew chapter 21. Colossians 3.11 Where there is neither Greek nor Jew circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, bond nor free, but all, but Christ is all and in all. Romans 10, chapter 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto them, unto all who call upon him. Very, very clear, right? Galatians 3:28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. It's very clear, folks. It's not even a debate. It's not debatable. This is what the scriptures say. So let's move in and read Matthew chapter 21. We're dealing with the triumphal entry here. Where Jesus rides in upon an ass and everybody's saying Hosanna. And you know, uh, then Jesus goes in and cleanses the temple. Um, ridding it of people who were trying to make a profit. He then goes on to curse the fig tree 
and then we have the parables and the main parable at the end being the parable of the tenants. All right, let's get started. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and where come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied to a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, and a foal of an ass. Of course, the prophecy that he's speaking about there is from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And so, the Jewish people would have recognized what Jesus is doing, because they knew that the king to come would do this. Verse uh, 5, or I'm sorry, verse 6. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt and put them on their cloths, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in a way. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a house of thieves. And if you go look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, it says, Is this house, which is called by name, my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and suckling thou hast perfected praise? Which is a psalm, by the way. If you go to Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, Out of the mouth of babes and suckling hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Moving forward, verse 17, And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. You know, what's interesting is I often hear prophecy teachers, uh, especially dispensationalists and things of that nature, teaching that the, that the fig tree is Israel. And that the fig tree blesses Israel, or refers to Israel, and you see the fig tree blooming, you know, that, and they say, see, when Israel's coming back, that's when you know, and they say all this thing, all these things. But if you look at this instance right here, if I were Israel, I would hope that that's not true, right? And when I say Israel, I'm talking about the physical, political land of Israel. Because Jesus just walks up to this tree, which is a fig tree, he finds nothing growing on it. In other words, it's not bearing fruit. And he curses it and says, let no fruit grow on you henceforth forever. And it says, and presently the fig tree withered away. Verse 20. 
And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Jesus answered them and said to them, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you shall say unto a mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders and the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what you think? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and he said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and he went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and he said, I go, sir. And he went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in a way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye seen it, repented not afterwards, that ye might believe him. So Jesus tells this parable of two sons. He tells the first son, uh, go work in the vineyard. And the son said, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. But afterwards, he repents and he goes ahead and does it. The second son says, sure, I'll go do it, right? But then he doesn't do it. It's just, he's just, it's just, he's just using words. You know, I, I see this in the assembly today, in the church today. People who are Christian only by mouth, but not in deed. And there is a difference here. And then Jesus connects it back to the Pharisees, to the Jewish religious people, saying, Barely I say to you that the publicans and the harlots are going to go into the kingdom before you. This is not my words, by the way. This is Jesus. For John came into you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when you seen it, repented not afterward that you might believe him. And now Jesus goes into this parable of the tenants. And I don't know how anybody can confuse this. It's extraordinarily clear. And so let me read it, and then I'll break it down for you, and then I'll go pull some commentary too, just to, just so it's not just my words, not my just my opinion or interpretation. Verse twenty-one, or Matthew twenty-one, verse thirty-three. Here another parable. There was a certain householder, which planted a vineyard, and hedged it round about, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower and lent it out to the husbandman, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandman, that they might receive the fruit, fruits of it. And the husbandman took the servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and they cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? All right. Let me stop right here. This should be very, very clear to all of us what this parable represents. Um, you know, it's talking about Israel. 
And God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And what did they do to all the prophets? They killed them. And then God says, I'm going to send my son, right? And he sends his son. And what happens to Jesus? They kill the son as well, right? And then he asks a question to the Pharisees. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy the wicked men, and will let out his vineyard to another husbandman, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So even the Pharisees, upon hearing this, say, Hey, you're, he's going to destroy those who did these terrible things, and he's going to give the vineyard to someone else. Verse 42, Jesus saith to him, Did you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say unto you, who's, you, who's the you? The you is the religious leaders, right? The Jewish religious leaders. That's who Jesus is talking about. Therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. And, if, and in case you think that I'm wrong about this interpretation, even the Pharisees here and the priest interpret it the same way, as you can see in verse 45. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard his parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude, because they took him for a prophet. Now, I've always read that parable, and... It was very, very clear to me. It's never been confusing. But I thought, before I go through it, I better go check out to check out some commentary and just make sure um, that I don't have it, that there's not another thinking on this. And so I'll, I go to the two that I think are the most reliable. So let's go to Charles Spurgeon first. And this is what he has to say. You see at once... How this parable related to the leaders of the Jewish people. From generation to generation, they scorned the prophets of God, persecuted them, and put them to death. And when our Lord himself appeared, through his glory might, easily have been seen by them, yet they cast him out from among them and put him to death. That's Charles Spurgeon. Let's go to Matthew Henry, great commentator. This parable plainly sets forth the sin and ruin of the Jewish nation. And what is spoken to convict them is spoken to caution all that enjoy the privileges of the outward church. And you can go on and you can look up those commentaries for yourself if you want to read in more detail. It's not my opinion, friends. This is what Jesus has to say. And look, I don't know why people get so upset about the good news that the kingdom has been opened up to anyone and everyone who will believe upon the Savior. You know, that was the plan from the very beginning, that God would send a Redeemer, but you have to have faith in the Redeemer. If you reject the Redeemer, then you reject God's provision, and there's no salvation or repent, or uh, there's no salvation or forgiveness of sins available. It's by faith. The people in the Old Testament, their faith was that the Messiah would come and redeem them. Our, today, it's our faith is in the Messiah who has come. And been raised from the dead and we believe he's coming again. But it's all about faith in Jesus. You, it doesn't matter your bloodline. Like I said, you can speak the best Hebrew, you can live in Israel. But if you reject and spit on the name of Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Plain and simple, folks. And I know people are going to unsubscribe, people are going to pull their funding from Patreon. It always happens whenever I have to dare tell the truth. But the point... But the thing is, guys, as I'm not interested in pleasing men or being everybody's favorite, if there's only one person left to preach to, I'll preach to that one person. You know, this is why church pastors won't tell the truth up on the stage. This is why they won't talk about end times and call people to repent and talk about these things because they're worried that, uh, you know, attendance and money will go away. And uh, I'm not going to compromise on the truth. And uh, all I've done here is read you the scriptures plainly. And uh, 
and hopefully it speaks to your spirit and speaks to your heart. It's very, very clear. Go read the church fathers. They weren't confused about this. This is the only generation to be confused about this. I mean, it's been very, very clear through church history. All right. Peace and grace be with all of you. And Lord willing, I'll be back with you on Monday. God bless.